without further ado, I would now like to introduce you all to our panelists this afternoon. Alicia Arrington, Alicia, if you want to wait for us, hello. Um, a native of Richmond, Virginia, is a career consultant who joined LHH in 2016. Her professional expertise is in operations management with line experience and human resources. She has led teams of up to 20 multidisciplinary employees with accountability for seven figure client portfolios. She has extensive leadership experience in training, employee engagement, workforce development, PL management, contract service management, and customer service. Alicia's blended professional background also consists of 10 years within human resources and recruitment. Her leadership experience in these arenas included performance management programs, talent sourcing, coaching and development, as well as onboarding. Her customer base was comprised of clients in the pharmaceutical, housing, financial services, and tobacco industry. So, so happy to have you with us, Alicia. So next up, Lori Jennings, a trusted advisor, tech champion. Lori's tech career started at tech giants, EMC and Cisco before moving to a regional data consulting company and leading their sales team. At CRT, she found a passion for recruitment and transition from tech sales to permanent placement of tech executives and leadership by founding what is now Jennings ProSearch in 2008. Lori has advised mid-market consulting firms, private equity, and startups, filling a niche recruiting need for in-demand and critical executive level tech talent. Her passion for tech combined with her unique business acumen and extensive network provide her clients unparalleled access to some of the best tech talent, many of whom are not active on traditional online search platforms. So happy to have you with us, Lori. Yes. And last, but certainly not least, we have Christopher Jones, an analyst for Viacom CBS. While at VCU, he realized his passion for entertainment and decided on an early graduation track to get the head start. After working for a film studio in Richmond for his first year post-graduation, he moved to NYC. There, he worked for a number of nonprofit organizations, most recently, the Paley Center for Media ultimately working his way to a Fortune 500 media conglomerate. During his six year journey to Viacom, he has seen everything when it comes to career exploration, from pitfalls and false hopes, making the switch from nonprofit to for-profit, to networking and interviewing with over a dozen entertainment companies in the New York City area. He has substantial experience as a career explorer. So happy to have you with us, Chris. Um, and Chris will also um, actually be hopping off a little early, but we'll still be able to hear some great tips from um, his own career exploration. So again, thank you all for being here and let's jump into this conversation. So the first question that we received from one of our registrants uh, was what have you all noticed to be some changes in the job market and job postings um, and what employers are looking for since COVID-19? And Chris, I'm going to pivot this first question to you, given you've most recently gone through navigating your job search during um, this interesting different time um, of the job market. So, you know, what have you noticed to be any difference, you know, from, you know, maybe before to now? Um, I think uh, some of the biggest things that I noticed was in 2020, there was a huge dip in the amount of postings. Um, and then uh, somewhere around the beginning of this year, uh, it all seemed to come back um, as far as the NYC area goes. Um, so in fact, it seems that there's more postings than ever before uh, right around now, um, especially within companies. I know at Viacom, I mean, it was hundreds of postings around March and April, uh, yeah. which is a good thing. Um, that was a big thing I noticed. Um, I didn't see too much of a change in the type of jobs being posted uh, since COVID-19, but um, a really big thing that uh, some of the interviews led me to was um, asking about uh, willingness to go back to the office. Yeah. Something uh, I saw uh, change. And then just... Um, a lot of people actually asked me kind of about my off hours availability. Uh, it seemed to change a little bit because I guess it's easier to go to your desk if you're at home. Yeah. So that was a question that I saw more of uh, as far as virtual 
job interviews. So that's what I would say for that. Yeah, great. Um, Alicia, what are your thoughts? What have you seen, you know, to be a change, if at all? Um, and, and Chris touched on some of them. Yeah, and I was just going to add about the remote opportunities. That's what I think I'm seeing a lot more of, um, or hybrid opportunities that are out there. Um, other than that, I, you know, other than the influx of need, <laughs> as Chris mentioned about um, companies are hiring. Yeah, they are. High. And you know what? People are leaving their companies and going to other companies. So, yeah, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. And just to touch a little bit more on and Chris, sorry to pivot it back to you, but was there anything different that you saw in the actual interview process, if at all? Um, you know, given that, you know, maybe before you were going in person and doing interviews in person versus virtually, was there any change to that? There is a slight relief not having to go uh, into an in-person interview as far as body language mm. and the energy that you put off. Um, I would say that uh, if you're nervous, it's much harder to detect virtually. Yeah. Um, and so I did find myself a bit calmer during my virtual interviews uh, than I would have having to put on the suit and go in person to an executive's office. Uh, it was a different experience that way. Um, it's yeah. a little bit more laid back, I suppose, but also they have more of an opportunity to really lay on the questions in a virtual environment, I think. Mm, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Lori, any, any way in here? Have you seen anything different from the recruiting side of things? Well, it's funny that Chris said one thing. I would say a little bit the opposite. It's a lot of people, I'm an extrovert, so I, I feed off of energy being in person. Mm. And I think if you're an extrovert, you it's harder to interview and show your passion because I talk like this. And, you know, when I'm in an interview in person, I can my personality can come through. So I think it's a little harder. But almost all, all interviews have been, at least my clients, uh, virtual to the point where many times you're having to accept an offer where you've never met anybody in person or never yeah. been on site. You know, you can learn so much by going on site, by looking at people, how they interact. You can't really do that in the virtual world. So you have to do a lot more research, ask some really good questions to make sure you really understand what you're getting into, I think, in the virtual world. And if there's pros and cons. It opens you up to, I think Alicia mentioned, remote opportunities that aren't in your location. At the same time, it makes it much more competitive for you because you're competing against people from all over the country now. Yeah. But you really do have to stand out. You have to be ready. You have to, you know, so Chris said it's laid back. Maybe it is laid back, but still be on time, still dress professionally. You still have to do all those things. And I do see people tending to loosen up some of that. Sometimes yeah. with t-shirts and things that, you know, I get calls. Oh my God, this person's in a t-shirt. Or this person is two minutes late to their video call. Yeah. You can't do that. So I think it may be more laid back depending on if you're, you know, you're an introvert, extrovert, but um, it could be a little bit uh, more daunting sometimes when you have video issues and things like that you have to check out. Yeah, for sure. So there's pros and cons um, to, to it all. And another thing I see a lot, my clients are asking for, I think there's, and I think candidates are asking for this, is they want to get to know you better. People want to understand about your culture, your mission. They want, people want purpose in their jobs more now than ever. And I think people are interviewing want to have that cultural fit. Yeah. There's a big, big, big push now for companies for di diversity, equity, inclusion more than ever before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah which is a good thing, Right. Well, you still want to make sure that people really mean it and they're not just talking it because you can they can just say all the words and then yep. not back it up. So yep. that, that push too in the last year. Yes, great. Um, so our next question talks a little bit more about, you know, that job exploration. What are the best current methods for finding jobs? Is there anything different? Is there anything new that you all have seen? Uh, whether it's certain job search sites, um, just different platforms, you know, what have you all seen to be any of the best current methods for finding jobs? Alicia? It's the, it's the one thing that I always say, networks are the best current me me method for finding a job. Yeah. Um, platforms, indeed, LinkedIn's, they're great for research. They're great for helping you tailor your resume. They're great for all of that sort of knowledge you need to know that what's that audience looking for? but it's the people you know, it's your network that is the most efficient 
and best way yeah. to find a job. Yeah. Lord. I a hundred percent agree with what Alicia just said, but I will tell you an area that you need to really be um, focused on is LinkedIn. That yeah. is the number one place recruiters go. And if you apply to a job or, or you, somebody mentions your name through, a, their, through networking, the first thing we're going to do is go look at your LinkedIn site. We're going to know yeah. what you're about. That's a place LinkedIn's doing a great job there. There's now a place that they've done through video. I think you can only do it um, through your mobile app, hmm. a, 30 cent record, a 30 second recording. So you can say how to pronounce your name. Which oh you can, yeah, I have that. Yeah, I'm Lori Jennings. Yep. I'm looking for uh, this type of job or whatever. You can tell your story yeah. and you need to do that. You need to fill out your about section. You need to be out there commenting and looking and doing, you know, Commenting, letting people see you. There's so much you can do to network on LinkedIn. Yeah. And then a way to do things, it, networking, like Alicia said, whereas you may not be able to do it in person as much, I think that's opening up again. Get on here like right now, and I want to see you in this chat box, and I want to see your video when you can be on video. If they offer that, show your face. Yeah. Ask questions, make comments, and then afterward, Josh, at all right now, be looking all of our names up on LinkedIn and inviting us to connect with you and sending us a note to say, hey, I attended this webinar. I really appreciate some of your insights. I want to connect or whatever. Yeah. So That's I think great. network, network, yep. Chris, what about you? You know, when you search for the position that you're in now, you know, what did that look like for you as far as, far as finding this position? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, for me, I, um, it was really about utilizing my network as far as the people I had already met face to face. Um, for me personally, and again, I was trying to target this whole time kind of a specific industry. And I know that not everyone is in that boat. Um, but for me, kind of the um, any kind of cold calling or cold emailing that you see through the use of these websites or just like pushing out applications by the dozens didn't help me as much as reaching out to people I'd met and um, seeing what they could do for me and connecting me to other people. Um, and that's actually what led me to a lot of the job interviews I had before I got at Viacom. Um, and it's actually what led me to the Viacom job as well. Um, yeah. And um, yes, because you know, for me, every interview I get, there's probably at least 20 applications behind one interview. Um, yeah. And I would say that one interview is more likely for me to come from somebody that I've known. Yeah. And so you said a, a key word there is that, you know, you were more targeted in your search and, you know, in the application. So that kind of pivots us to our next question. Um, they came from a, a registrant. Should I prioritize sending a higher quantity of applications or more tailored, higher quality applications. I kind of feel like they answered their question in the question, but Lori, what are your thoughts? <laughs> we are absolutely more tailored. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so obvious when you're spraying and praying and it is a turnoff and you don't stand out, you need to take that time, like Chris said, to really focus, to get that interview. And when you get that interview, you need to research, know about what that company's doing, know the people that are there, have questions. That takes a lot of time. So definitely yeah. want to tailor it. Yeah. Any other weigh-ins from anybody? Yeah. Um, just, you know, I always, as I work with clients, I always say, you got to know your audience because yeah. you are the CEO of your business and you're trying to pitch your business to someone who wants to buy it. Yeah. So it needs to be tailored to that audience. What It's not about what you want, it's what they need. What can you do for them? And that's what you're selling. That's what you're marketing about your business. So it should always be tailored to the audience you're trying to reach. Great. That's perfect. I'm going to go into some of our questions from folks that are in, um, in attendance with us today. So I'm going to go back and forth. Um, so bear with me. So we did have a question. Um, if any of you all are familiar with using, I'm guessing this is a platform called HireVue for virtual interviews. Um, I see Alicia nodding her head. Um, could you weigh in on that or, you know, is there any tips or anything with using a platform such as that? Um, it's just a, a, a video interview okay. platform. Um, it, it gives you questions. It does time you, you've got a, your webcam or, you know, whatever, and you answer the questions. I just think 
I don't care what the platform is when you're interviewing, you need to show up and present yourself as the professional, answer your questions, make sure you keep that eye contact with your webcam as you're talking. Um, it's just the same things that you would do if you were sitting in the room with me because yeah. people can still see you and they record you. Um, and one of the things I think the best practice for this is make sure you're doing some mock interviews. Mm. So you can, um, if, if possible, I have clients record themselves telling their stories to make sure that they can come back and go, okay, that's not really what I said, let me tweak it. Because yes. interviewing is a practice sort of thing. You know, it's, it, you'll never get good at it unless you do it a lot of times. But it really, especially in the recorded piece, at least I find, um, the more comfortable I am telling my story, the more concise and clear it is. And I'm not rambling, I get to the point. Uh, and I'm presenting this business the way I want it to be seen. Yeah. I guess that's the, the takeaway from those platforms. And there are a lot of them out there. Yeah, that's perfect. So I'm guessing that's a, a difference of like just Zoom, where it's something that's already pre or pre having you to record and they're doing that. Okay. Um, another question that came in, so I'm gonna give this one to you, Lori it says, I've a I have been applying to jobs and noticed that some jobs require you to take assessments. Do the, the recruiters check your assessment scores? Do you know anything about that? It depends on who's giving the assessments. If it's the recruiter, like an external firm like me, and I was to do a score, yes, I'm going to see the score. Um, typically, it's going to be with companies directly. They're going to have some type of assessment. That's pretty standard. A lot of companies do that. Um, and they will see your scores. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And then a lot of times I'll share them with you. Yeah. I think sometimes, I don't know, Alicia, what are you seeing with that? Cause y'all probably do that internally in HR. Well, it's, it's um, a lot of them can be predictive indexes to mm -hmm. make sure that you fall into whatever that matrix that they're looking for that talent to fall in. Cause it's not just about your competence. It's about compatibility, chemistry. Are you going to fit? Are you going to be able to do you know, play nice in the sandbox, I like to say, with other people who are here. Um, some of them are, um, you know, maybe logical. They want to know how you problem solve. How do you come? I mean, they're just different assessments that are based on the needs of the organization. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times, if you are taking um, an assessment, especially one that's sort of lengthy, and I've had this experience, um, they'll let you know in advance, the recruiter will tell you, here's a practice link, go here and practice so you can understand how to answer the question. Um, because they're usually time bound, it's like you don't have a whole lot of time. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to be taking assessments, sometimes they just pop up at the end of your application process. But a lot of those are more predictive indexes to find out if this personality Mm -hmm. is going to be a fit into this world. And one of our attendees on the, um, in the event, Melody, she said, if you requested, the recruiters um, sometimes will be happy to share it with you. I've tried um, it before. So yeah, you want to ask if they say you have to do an assessment, make sure you understand how much time it's going to take. Because I see sometimes people think it, you know, not putting enough aside and then they blow it or they don't practice like Alicia mentioned. Ask the recruiter, whoever's giving this to you, you know, what to expect before you start to take this test. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. All right. Another question that came in is, I don't see many entry-level opportunities, yet companies are complaining they cannot fill roles. As recruiters, how are you influencing the glut of available candidates to get hired? Any insight on that, Lori or Alicia? I think those opportunities are definitely there. Yeah. I, I don't recruit, um, but I understand the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also think companies need to be re truly realistic yeah. about um, what, are the, what are the strengths and capabilities that are needed to be able to be successful in the job. Um, and, you know, or it's, or you see things like entry level, and then I want you to have five years of experience. They just don't line up. It doesn't yeah. make sense. So I think it really is from my perspective, it's, um, they're out there. This is where your network can be helpful. <laughs> they're out there. It's about asking the right questions and also presenting your business, um, 
to whoever that audience is, to why you're that, va- what's your value proposition? What can you do? The opportunities I think are there, even if they don't call it entry level, um, it's gonna be those people you know and you talk to and tell what it is you wanna do. They're gonna help open those doors for you. Yeah, for sure. I always um, use this reference of like, it's job searching is like an iceberg, right? You see the tip of the iceberg, which is above the ocean. Those are just the jobs that are posted, you know, the things that you see on your, you know, job um, job search sites. But underneath is a much bigger iceberg that you're networking, you know, other ways to actually utilize. So I think when you see jobs like that and you just apply to them and you do not have the ideal experience, it's a waste of your time mostly. You know, and if you have the exact experience, go ahead and apply because, you you know, I, you'll probably somebody will reach out to you. If you don't, you need to, like Alicia said, you need to utilize that network, find people in that organization and understand. I, as a recruiter, I do try to get people sometimes um, when somebody stands out as far as their capabilities, but they may not have the exact experience. I try to give them that person. It doesn't always work. I mean, most of the time they're going to, you know depends on the candidate pool. If they can find somebody that has the experience, they're going to take that person every time. But if they can't, the good news is right now, there are more jobs, at least in tech, there are way more jobs than there are people to fill them. Mm. So they're going to start hiring people that don't meet every qualification. And that brings up a good point. It is probably very likely depending on the industry too. Yeah. Um, So um, I do want to ask this question. Um, that's from our registrants. What are the best time management strategies of applying to positions in the job market? So Chris, you know, when you were applying for your current job, you know, what did that look like? Were you, and maybe you were applying to multiple jobs at one time, you know, how were you managing your time in that? Cause it can be taxing. I mean, they always say searching for a job is a job. Oh yeah. <laughs> Um, well, it depends if you're currently not working. So for example, I also went through a layoff, uh, through the pandemic. So I was laid off in December. Um, if you're not working, make it your full-time job, wake up at 8am and do it until 5pm. It's the only way. And what do it means could be putting in applications. It could be taking coffee meetings or phone calls, but do it all day long until you get some bites and then don't stop. Uh, if you're working, I always, when, when I was searching for jobs, when I was working, um, I made a point, I would set like a quota for myself. I'd say, you know, Chris, get in 20 applications this week. Hit the 20, you can do it all in one day. You can do two a day, whatever. Um, so something to think about, but it definitely depends on, I guess, if you're working or not. Yeah, I like that setting a goal for yourself that you felt was achievable. Um, I like that a lot. Alicia, Lori. Any time management strategies you all have witnessed um, from applicants or any ones that you all have seen have worked? I say people are different. Like make sure you're working, like Chris said, a full time if it's if you don't have a job. If you do have a job, you're just gonna have to, like he said, you know, you're gonna have to fit it in when you can. Try to pick the times where you're most productive. If you're more productive in the morning or more productive in the evening, because you you definitely need to get your head out of it sometimes and go work out or do something else. So, yeah. um, but it needs to be a full-time job. I think it's helpful if you do like a marketing plan. Alicia's mentioned a lot about sales and you are selling yourself right now. Yep. You need to have a marketing sales plan, which are these, that's why targeting is better. Mm -hmm. Figure out 10 companies, go after them, research them, apply to them, talk to anybody you know that's there, do all of that and keep a spreadsheet. Make sure you're documenting everything and everybody you talk to, the notes you're talking to, because this, if you're not, you're going to, you know, you're going to start applying to the same jobs twice. You're going to start doing things that don't look professional. Sometimes I see people doing that. So, yeah. And I just like to add one more thing. If you are working, same thing. You should set aside virtual coffee breaks a couple of times a week. You should Mm. be having um, Zoom links work wonderful. And it's it's one of those things I encourage my clients to keep doing during the pandemic because people kept saying, oh, it's so difficult. I said, it's not difficult. It's different. Mm. So all you need to do is um, you have to be more intentional. But yeah. you do need to make sure you're still having conversations. So if you're working, you should be scheduling at least two 15 to 20 minute virtual coffee breaks or virtual lunch breaks, whatever you want to do to, to make sure you're engaging with your network. That's the most e- efficient and I think best strategy when you're in job search. Yeah, 
That's great. Um, and I know Chris is hopping off in a moment. So if, if attendees, if you do see him hop off, just know that, you know, he um, was able to bring a lot of good nuggets and tips. Chris, before you yep. hop off, was there anything that you wanted to share? Um, I would say anybody that's looking for a job, uh, just realize you're going to probably get more no's than you will get yeses. And to yeah. just um, to just try not to get discouraged and stay focused, because if you do that and you can get through the uh, through all the no's, somebody will say yes, I, I can yeah. guarantee you. And so. that kind of answer that question that we just got. How do you prevent job application rejection burnout? <laughs> yeah. I would say if, if you have a goal and you can wake up every day and continue to hold that goal and not change your mind a lot, I guess would be a way to put it, then it will help you get through the nose. That's great. So, thank you. But so I do have to hop off. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Chris. Yep. Thank All right, you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Uh, so we're going to continue on. I do want to continue with a question that we got um, from one of our attendees. Um, so Lori or um, Alicia, what are your, and you already shared this a little, Lori, uh, what are your thoughts on using LinkedIn for job searching? And then they also mentioned JobScan, uh, which is jobscan.co, uh, which I personally uh, recommend jobscan.co to a lot um, of alumni, a lot of friends, um, for the benefit of, and if people aren't familiar, it is a site that you are able to upload um, the job description um, as well as your resume. And so then it kind of looks at it like an applicant tracking system uh, where it goes through your resume and compares it to the job description and looks to see what are the keywords that you're using um, or not using mm -hmm. um, that you should actually be looking for. So it is a free resource. I think it is limited on how free it is. I think mm -hmm. you can't do but so many um, in a given time. So maybe use the incognito window <laughs> um, if you want to do it more um, than what the um, actual site allows. But any, Alicia, any insight into, you know, LinkedIn or jobscan.co? LinkedIn's a great site. As I said before, it, it is a great way to get connected to get to know people or to use your connections to help find the people you want to meet up with. Um, I am also a fan of jobscan.co. It's a great resume optimization tool, but there are millions of them out there. And if you Google resume optimization, you're going to get a bunch. Yeah. Um, but jobscan is a great one because it really helps you um, try to tailor um, your resume to the job that you are actually applying for. Because the human being is not going to be the first person to see it. The machine is. Correct. So you do have to, as I like to say, learn how to game the system a little bit because you don't <laughs> want to disqualify yourself because you haven't marketed the right things to the audience. Yeah. And that's where those tools can be helpful. But I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. I think it's a, it's a great tool because you can research, you can find out qualifications you need, you can find out skill sets you need to highlight, you can connect to people inside of organizations. It's a great platform to help you basically manage your career. Yeah. That's it's great. also a great marketing platform for you, especially if you don't have experience. I know you're getting frustrated with that. So how do you stand out? I mean, it does take you to be bold. This last year, I've had to switch my business to online. I've had to make all these videos and I'm 54 years old and this did not come natural for me. Yeah. You know, it is tough. But I will tell you, the results are there. When you put a video and the time into it, it really shines. Um, and I've got a couple followers, if y'all are interested. Jonathan Palmer, Trevor Houston, and Austin Beltkeck. And I'm going to put these in the chat box for y'all. If you go follow them, they have some great videos on how to optimize LinkedIn. No, perfect. Especially this Trevor Houston. He's out there helping people get jobs. Who do you know? He calls it, who do you know? <laughs> because it's all about being seen and knowing people. And, you know, if you're brave enough to put a video out there that says, hey, I'm Lori Jennings, I'm looking for a job in this area. This is my first video and blah, 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 blah. And then you tag some people like myself and other influencers. And then you get these comments. People are so nice to you. If you, It's amazing. Oh, yeah. 
you definitely, you know, just being outside the box. And, and like you said, it's, I think it's with LinkedIn is what you put into it, right? Yeah. It's only going to benefit you as much as you put into it. So whether that is you sharing articles that may be in your industry on LinkedIn and asking people what they think about it. Um, and even I, I remember years ago, I, I wrote some articles um, on LinkedIn, just some resume tips. And it, it went viral, um, not viral in the sense of how social media goes viral now, but like for LinkedIn, I thought it was pretty good. And so, you know, it was my industry. So again, if you are, um, you know, somebody that is seeking, you know, maybe outside the box ways, or, you know, I know that there was a question that came in about, you know, what are some things to keep me current other than updating my resume? Definitely utilizing opportunities like that, I think is great. Uh, we did get one, a comment. Oh, go ahead. I'm one more thing I do want to add, if you think of your LinkedIn profile as your professional commercial, mm. and that's how you need to look at it because it, it runs 24-7. Yeah. And it gives you the opportunity to get visibility around your brand. So if you look at it as your marketing tool, you want to go out there and build your commercial, have a great, have a great billboard. Yeah. Have a, you know, have, the, have that image, have that background photo, have that story, talk a little bit about your experiences, your skills, but remember who your audience is when you're building it. Yeah. But if you, if you're not there, no one's going to find you. Yeah. I love that. Um, we did have an attendee share for those that might not have seen, um, just a comment. I was totally caught off guard when I was laid off nearly two years ago, I joined a local support group called Career Prospectors, best decision I ever made. So there are, you know, groups, whether it's locally, yes. So Alicia- I, you I, Hey, I'm a um, past graduate of Career Prospectors. It's go. a great group and it's free. It is a free access to help you in your job search and prepare you for that um, task of finding that new adventure for yourself. So yes, great group. Great group. Yes. Great, great, great. So yeah, you know, whether it's locally, you're finding, you know, groups, there are groups also on LinkedIn too. So, you know, if there are um, industry related groups that you can find on LinkedIn, definitely utilize those. Yeah. Um, meetup groups are a great way, especially if you're career change, because I think we have some career change folks on here and if, say people want to get into IT all the time. They're like, how do I do it? Yeah. You need to know where the people are. So Anything, if you want to be a data scientist or you want to be a business analyst, I think I saw somebody saying I wanted my first job as a business analyst, go into some of the agile, the product owner, the um, product tank, um, look up local meetup groups, right? Mm -hmm. You don't even have to be local now because people are everywhere, but look them up, attend an event, go in there, ask questions, and then you see somebody, ask them, just say, hey, I'm trying to get into, the, would you spend 10 or 15 minutes giving me some advice? What do I need to know? Yeah. People are very, very helpful. Yeah. Ask people about their stories. I think that's a great way to sort of start that conversation is tell them, how, you know, I'm, I'm look, I'm looking, you know, this might be my next adventure. Tell me how you got here. Yeah. That's great. Um, so I'm going to skip down to some questions that I submitted to our panelists beforehand, but I'm going to ask more so of some potential red flags um, to look out for when you're, you're looking for uh, a position, whether it's remote, whether it's virtual, whether it's in person, you know, what are some red flags? Alicia, what are your thoughts? Um, there are a whole bunch of them. <laughs> and I think, but I also think that you also know it. Yeah. You, you feel it when something doesn't seem right. One of those big things that I've been reading about this is someone's reaching out to you, not from a company website, but from a Gmail account. Mm. That's kind of crazy. Yeah. Or um, the company wants you to use your own equipment mm -hmm. with this new job. Um, if they start asking you too many personal questions before you get past the screening, yeah, it's probably time to say, um, hold on a minute. How is this relevant to the job? There, I mean, I think people sort, if you start to feel uncomfortable, you need to ask yourself, why am I uncomfortable? Yeah. It, why is this experience not feel right? Or why is this um, site? Here's another thing. If you can't find this company anywhere, might be the biggest red flag. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely that's, that's a that's where I'm going to stop my list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, Lori. What are your thoughts? Well, that's a good one right there. So I I don't know if you've seen it on LinkedIn. Sometimes I get these messages. You've been you know yep selected to apply for this job, and they send yep. you a link. It's like you know be scared. Okay, look, <laughs> um, that shouldn't happen first of all. But if they do, um. 
look up the company. Don't open that link because it could be a phishing thing. Go to the company, say if it's Dominion, they say they're from Dominion Power. Go see if you find that job on their website directly. Make sure it's posted there. Do some research. Um, if they ask you, if they offer you a job without hardly interviewing and knowing anything about you, that's scary. Um, they'll ask you to wire money sometimes. That's obvious, but believe me, it happens. Or to buy equipment, like I think Alicia mentioned, or pay for some type of training. Um, or they ask you for your social security number, your driver's license, you know, um, too early. Unless you're applying for the job on a website with, you know, that's protected and all of that, um, yeah. you know, directly they're getting to that. Don't give them that information on you. And even app, even websites don't even have that. You, no one's asking you for your social security till after they've given you an offer and you said yes, yeah. and you're filling out the new hire paperwork. You should not be sharing that information on any site. Yeah, that's great. Um, so the next question I'm going to ask, and again, if you all, you all have been sending in great questions. So I've been going back and forth. So keep them coming if you have more uh, for our panelists. So you can even put those in our Q&A uh, box or in the chat. Um, so what networking tips uh, would help an introvert? Um, you know, networking can be kind of daunting for anybody, let alone for somebody who may identify you know, as an introvert, especially when we were doing a lot of in-person um, networking events, are there any tips or anything you all would share for somebody like that, Lori? Well, I think if you have a friend, <laughs> that's always helpful that you can go with to an in-person event that makes it so you're not just standing there in a corner by yourself if you're introverted. I think another thing is um, look beforehand um, if an event you're gonna maybe attend, if there's a person's name, you know, um, the toasting it, write them and say, you know, I'm introverted. I'd like to come. I'm looking for, you know, to meet some new people. Is there anybody there? You know, just try to reach out and see, let them know. I, I, this is a hard one. Yeah. Yeah. I have a hard time and I'm an extrovert sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have, a, I have a best practice, and this is actually from a colleague of mine who is an introvert and one of the best networkers I know. And he goes to a lot of events, but he sets a goal. Each event, he only um, his goal is to introduce and meet two new people. He's mm. there only 30 minutes, and then he leaves. Mm. But I, because I think um, people try to do too much, and I'm an extrovert too, but I like quality conversations, Yeah. not speed dating. Yeah. Um, so I, even as an extrovert, I don't want to talk to 20 people in a night. Yeah. I, if I can have two decent conversations in that 30 minutes, then I felt like it's a successful networking opportunity. Uh, but don't overdo it. And it's probably best to do one-on-ones. Maybe you go there and you meet those people. And then you may say, I'd love to pull up with you, have coffee. Because I think that's less um, draining of the battery, so to speak, yeah. in, in those in you know, in those sort of formats, but don't try to talk to everybody. Just say, I'm going to introduce myself to two people and I'm gone. There you go. It sounds like our theme here is quality over quantity when it comes to everything. <laughs> Great. And so somebody even gave this tidbit too. Thank you, Jennifer. Bathroom break resets are good too. Um, so our car resets if close by, like just to you know, get yourself together, maybe do a, you know, a super, I always say Superman or Superwoman pose and, you know, build some of that confidence. So yeah, that's great. Um, we have a question here. What are good strategies that came in from an attendee? What are good strategies for finding a remote position uh, from locating opportunities to interview tips? So any, any tips specifically on remote positions? LinkedIn has a yeah. lot of them, your network. Yeah. Um, but even with your network, I always tell people, and, and Lori mentioned this before, creating a marketing plan, you should make a list of the organizations you're targeting. Start there because it's overwhelming. If um, I'm, you know, I always say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. But it's too big a thing to think, I need, I'm looking for a remote job. Are there 10 to 12 companies that you're focusing on because you've done research and their mission and their, their um, you know, vision aligns with yours and the skill sets? Start there first. Uh, yep. Kind of, 
um, look at those companies, but use sites like LinkedIn to see if there are remote activities. Go to their LinkedIn site, see who you know. Yeah. Tap into or who you're connected to who could introduce you to someone inside that organization. Start, I, I think that's a better way to think about it, but you should know who you're targeting. It's not a, let me go out here and see what comes up. You should really do the homework and say, what are the top 10 or 12 companies that I would even want to work for? Yeah, that's good. All right. So we also had a question um, and I'll let you all weigh in, but um, how do I make connections with VCU alumni for jobs? And so I had to do a shameless plug here um, for this and I'm going to, copy and paste a little information about VCU Link. Um, so it is our own community. And so this site that I just linked is not the direct site to VCU Link, but it gives you a little bit more information about what VCU Link is. And so if you're looking to connect with alumni, I definitely say LinkedIn is a great place, but this VCU Link um, community is already um, put together of alumni who have already raised their hand to say that they want to help, they want to give back, they want to be able to help, whether it's students or fellow alumni and career advice um, in building those professional relationships. So I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, for someone looking for a job because, you know, we never want to do that. We want to build relationships. We don't want to just contact somebody, you know, to say, hey, can you get me a job? But it's all about that network, right? And building that relationship. So again, using VCU Link is a great way to grow your network, especially if you're just starting out of like, how do I even do that? How do I, Alicia talked a lot about this of those coffee chats and doing some mock interviews and informational interviews. This is a great way to start. And again, it's not just for students, but it's also for alumni to alumni as well. If you feel as though there may be an alum that's on the VCU Link platform that may be further along in their career, or even if they're in a different career that you're trying to pursue, definitely utilize this community to be able to reach out to engage uh, with alumni. And so even the link that I showed you, it talks a little bit about, you know, the difference between VCU Link and LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, but yeah, so definitely great access to connections that are VCU alumni that have been in your shoes um, that are familiar. You already have, and I think that's one of the biggest things too, right, is trying to find that commonality with someone. You already have something in common. You both went to VCU. You both know, you know, what it's like to experience um, being a RAM. So definitely utilize VCU Link. Any other um, tidbits? Alicia, you're in the in the community. Any, I'm in the community. You're in the community. So look me up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So yeah, so definitely if you haven't heard about it, you've heard about it now. So definitely sign up. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, and we could probably put my email in there um, in the chat um, as well. But yeah, definitely that. Can I make a comment? Because yeah. I, happening. I get, because I'm a recruiter, I guess. Um, yes. I get people reaching out to me from VCU um, all the time. Yeah. LinkedIn inviting me to connect. Um, when you reach out to somebody on there, make sure you have a targeted message because if you just reach out and you go, can we set up a 30 minute call? I mean, and you have no <laughs> reference, you have no, I mean, you know, that's not the professional way to do it. So <laughs> have a message. Like I just had somebody that was a veteran. I mean, he just came to me and he had a great, he says, can I just have 15 minutes of your time? I, you know, was a recruiter in the military. I've served for 20 years. I'm getting ready to retire. I have a personal coach. They think I might be a recruiter and I just need to, 10 or 15 minutes to understand your job. What is it recruiting to see if it's something I want to do? Yeah. Could you do? Of course, if a veteran reaches out to me, I'm going to say, absolutely. He gave me such a great authentic, you know, I went, absolutely. And thank you for serving the country. The least I could do is talk to you. I would have yeah. done this man. So have a little story, a message, make it personal. Don't just say, hey, can you give me 30 minutes of your time? Because people are busy. Right. Analyze it, take a little time, make sure the person is kind of in your industry that you're looking for and has something. You know, just don't randomly reach out to anybody from VCU and ask them to have to give them. <laughs> Definitely. 
No, definitely. I think that's a great tidbit too. I don't know if you all picked up on that, but even inserting, you know, how much of somebody's time, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you can say, hey, you know, I would love to chat for 15 to 20 minutes. Someone is more likely to, you know, respond back to that than you being a little bit vague and saying, hey, you know, can we chat? They don't know how long this conversation is going to be. They don't know what they're getting themselves into. So even if you can get even some parameters around that, but like Lori said, you know, as tailored as possible. So even going back, you know, to VCU link, there are um, actual uh, templates that are in there um, for messages, but that's just a start. That's just to help you begin that conversation. You want to tailor it to you um, and who you're reaching out to. So that is- and and also tell people why you want to meet with them, just like the yeah. veteran did. You, people are much more likely to help you if they know how they can. Yeah. So tell them why, why'd you choose me? Are you interested in knowing about my background, my, you know, my story or what I'm doing currently? Because even on LinkedIn or any platforms, these are not transactions. These are people. Yeah. And you have to, we got to connect on a human level before I'm going to care about trying to help you professionally. Yeah. So you need to keep that in mind when you're reaching out. This is another individual. This is a human being on the other side. Be yep. interested, be curious, be um, show up for this person who happens to do something that you want to you you maybe want to do. But it's a person first. It's not a transaction. Right. When you're done, thank them. Yes. Yep. Always, <laughs> always. Because exactly. they're taking time out of their day. And here's another thing you can do. Ask them, is there anything I could do for you? Mm. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. All righty. So we're going to shift gears kind of into more resume interviewing, some more tangible things. Um, so we talked a little bit about before just the networking and job search. Um, so we had a very specific question, but maybe this can be relatable to other people uh, too. Um, any resume writing tips for someone who is Currently a student with 10 plus years working experience, seeking opportunities in a new field. So um, Alicia, you know, any resume, maybe you want to talk about any resume writing tips that like shoot out at the head for you just in general, and then maybe talk a little bit about, you know, somebody who may be changing careers. As a career changer, here's the first thing I'm going to say, when you're writing a resume, um, figure out who your audience is and then brand for the audience, how you introduce your resume, what, how you talk about your business, um, you know, who are you, what do you do, what's valuable about it, and it should really be focused to what that audience would be looking for, then maybe pull out those transferable skills that you have, that that audience would want you to have. Um, and then talk about the things you've accomplished and you, you've, you've achieved. Uh, your resume shouldn't go back more than 10 to 15 years anyway. People are more interested in what you've done lately, what's your impact done, but make sure your resume tells a story. It's not an autobiography. It's a sales brochure. And I think if you think about it that way, it needs to be curated, customized to the audience. I think that's yeah. the biggest key about resumes is it, it's, it's not a, it's not my history. It's yeah. my value. It's my return on investment. And this is the document that communicates that that's, this is part of the communication strategy that I use around my business. Yeah. It tells you what I can do for you. It tells you the problems I can solve for you. And that's true. And skills are transferable. Right. Especially They're, if you're changing careers. Exactly. Right. Think about those skills that are needed in that new space. And those are the ones you advertise. Yeah. That's what I promote. That's great. I totally agree. And this is where it comes down to talking to people that are in the roles that you want to be in, doing informational interviews, finding out what it's like, getting an understanding, finding out, you know, their thoughts on how they transitioned their stories, like Alicia mentioned. And then being able to communicate those, you know, how your skills are going to transition when you, when you reach out, have a customized note. I mean, cover letters is a lot. People, some people don't like them. I personally like them if they're well-written and they're mm -hmm. customized. Yeah. Especially if you're in career change and you don't meet my requirements that I have listed. But if you write me a well-targeted saying, hey, I recognize I don't have this, 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 but here's what I do. And this is how these skills will help transfer. I've done some research. You're sharing what you've done. I've, I've looked up, I've done some tutorials. I've done this. You're showing me what you're doing. I'm going to take your call and we're going to talk. And even though you may not be a fit for my role and I may tell you no, 
I'm going to talk to you and, and I'm going to give you some advice and it's going to be worth your time. That's, That's great. Yeah. And those who are changing careers, um, Alicia was able to share with us a resource that uh, we did drop in the chat. Um, so definitely take a look at that resource if that is who you are and where you are now um, of changing careers. Also wanted to mention to be on the lookout for, uh, we typically do it once in the spring, once in the fall is our Alumni Career Design Fellowship um, that allows for a 30-day online program to really dig deeper into, you know, what that next career um, looks like and designing what that is for you, even if you don't necessarily know what it is. Um, so again, if that if that is you and you are looking for that, yes, we just dropped the link to explain a little bit more about it, but uh, we are working with um, with our partners on that to have it for the fall. So a, a link will be on that page shortly. All right, so we kind of talked a little bit and we're actually um, dwindling down on time, but I am gonna ask this question. Um, you know, are there any tips to prepare for virtual interviews? Um, anything that's outstanding or anything we didn't cover, anything? I know that we talked a little bit about it already though. I think the only change, this is my last in, I, I don't think the interview process is really any different um, other than geographically. Yeah. Um, the one thing that you need to worry about in the virtual setting is to make sure your equipment works. <laughs> Yeah. Test out, make sure your Wi-Fi is up and running, that it's rebooted, that your webcam works. But other than that, you got to show up. You need to present yourself professionally. You need to be ready. Here's another um, good best practice or kind of the upside of an interview is I can have some notes in front of me. I can have little um, cues to, uh, um, to maybe lead into my source stories that I'm going to tell about, you know, how I've done something before and what the value's been. That's, you know, uh, nice to have because you can kind of have, you know, little things in front of you, but you still need to show up, be professional, have your questions ready. Um, but I think the difference is check your technology. Yeah. That's, that can just ruin a day. Yeah. <laughs> if something just doesn't work or you can't connect, have, make sure you have the phone number of the recruiter or the person mm -hmm. you're going to you're going to be talking to. So if you do lose power or something goes down, you can contact them, keep that conversation going. Yeah, it could be thundering like it is now. Yep. Where I am. <laughs> yes. Yes, and I have lost even facilitating classes. I've lost power. Yeah. In the middle of a class, training class. So it's, you know, it's always I can text some one of my coworkers and say, can you go into my class and then let them know I'm, I'm coming right back, yep. you know, whatever it is, just it's there's, there's the technology piece that's different. Perfect. Yeah. And if you, um, if you are scheduled for a video call, you have to show up on video, do not show up and not turn on your video and say, sorry, I, you know, if there's an issue, reschedule or let them know, Hey, I'm having a problem. This is why I can't do it. Can we reschedule? Or are you okay with me doing it via phone or whatever? Don't do that. I've had people do that to me. That immediately is going to get you eliminated. That is. Yeah. <laughs> so I would yeah. say that and make sure this is something I don't think you realize how much noise can go on in the background. So make sure you don't have distractions going on around you make people walking behind you and all of this stuff i know that happens but when you're interviewing you need to dedicate that amount of time and tell people i'm sorry can you stay in the other room or you you just have to really really people do understand if yeah things yeah. Happen, use a background if there are people in the house with you <laughs> yes and i was going to say i've used my local library um yep. in the past to rent out you know, a room to be there by myself to not worry about noise. So definitely look into that. Um, we do have one last question. I wanted to make sure we ask our panelists um, because we are going to be ending at one. So the next question that came in is how do I say no in a nice way to a job offer that offers everything I may be looking for, but not exactly what I need? So it sounds like there's a difference between wants and need there, you know, just in general, how do I turn down a, a job offer nicely? So, you know, nicely. I, yeah. So that I don't <laughs> burn bridges, right? Right. Nicely. Right. Just, you know what? Things happen. Situations yeah. change and people understand that. But this is something that I would, two points, I guess. 
depends on where you are in the conversation. If you're maybe in your second interview and through those conversations, you realize that this isn't really going to be a fit for you, or you're not going to be able to devote the time, energy um, that you need to this job, you need to say something then. Yeah. You need to tell that recruiter uh, after you come out of that interview, say, you know what, after some careful consideration, I don't think this is a good time for me. And sometimes it is about timing. Now, if you get, hopefully, if you have gotten to the third round and you're at that offer stage, um, unless there is another offer, because this is how I'm thinking this question is, make sure the other offer is in the bank before you say no to this one. Make yeah. sure you've gotten the offer letter, you've signed it and you send it back and you're filling out your onboarding <laughs> materials before you say no to another opportunity. Yeah. Because I've known people who've done that. And then the one that they thought they, the one they wanted and one they said yes to fell through. And then yeah. they didn't have any opportunities. So it's different, but it's it's the same way. It's like, you know what? Do some careful consideration. I've, I've found that this opportunity doesn't, fit me right now or doesn't align with where I need to be or for whatever the reason is you don't have to go into detail yeah but thank them for giving you the opportunity to interview to thank you you know for giving me this time to share my value with me maybe in the future there could be an opportunity for me I wish you well in your search for your next candidate thank you so much for your time that's how you do it nicely that's wonderful um, so we're right at our Lord, were you going to admit? I'm no, sorry. I was just going to say, I 100% agree with all that. Treat people the way you want to be respected. Never ghost anybody. That's the worst. And this, it, it will come back around. If you just do it, be honest. Yeah. How you want That's to be great. treated. And sometimes say, hey, is there, maybe I could recommend somebody else. Link yeah. in with them. Be respectful. Maybe down the line. Is it everything Alicia said? Perfect. So we did have people asking about you all's LinkedIn's. Um, so I know that both of you are because I'm connected with both of them on LinkedIn. So if you just search their name on LinkedIn, um, you should be able to find them. Um, I want to thank you all so much um, for being able to provide your insight and your knowledge to today's conversation and Chris um, today. Lastly, everyone should now see a link to a short survey to complete so that we can get feedback and thoughts on today's event and how we can best shape our upcoming events. If you aren't able to grab that link before we end today, uh, we will also be sending it via email within 48 hours along with the recording. So on behalf of VCU Office of Alumni Relations, the VCU Alumni Recent Graduate Council and Virginia Credit Union Financial Success Center at VCU, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Alicia. Thank Take you, care. Leticia. Have a good Bye. day. You too. <laughs> Bye.